Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started with merging to Maine. Um, first off, I just want to give a shout out to Brandon Phillips. Uh, he's the He's been the host of Merging to Maine. He started the show. He's done an excellent job. And I know that many of you would have preferred to have seen his face today rather than mine. Unfortunately, he couldn't be with us. Um, and uh, he is going to be working on a new opportunity here. So um, Brandon's an amazing uh, guy. I'm very grateful to have worked with him and um, super brilliant expert, knows his stuff, uh, you know, hard worker, caring, just, just a brilliant person. So unfortunately, uh, he won't be joining us. Uh, and we are going to be having a new host of Merging to Maine, uh, which we will introduce shortly. It won't be me, uh, luckily. Um, uh, people are already sick of seeing me from, uh, get off the planet. So don't worry. You won't have to see me too much. Um, and then of course, today we have an amazing guest, uh, Ephraim, um, is joining us from the Tel Aviv stock exchange. Uh, Ephraim, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hello. My name is Ephraim Glatt. I am the DevOps team leader here in Tel Aviv stock exchange in Israel. And I'm super grateful for you for having me in this uh, podcast. And I hope we, we have fun. Uh, we have fun together in the next uh, one hour. Absolutely. So uh, as we go through this, you know, we're going to keep it fairly casual. We've got um, the chat is open, you know, and people are are calling out. And this seems already calling out. Amazed and delighted to be in the presence of the remarkable and highly talented Ephraim Glad. So your 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 reputation is preceding you. Um, as as you have questions or comments, please throw them in the chat. We'll be watching those. And uh, of course, if you have uh, coworkers that aren't already tuned in, send them the link right now. Tell them to hurry up and get in here. Um, and uh, just you know, minor housekeeping before we start. A couple of things are coming up. ArgoCon just around the corner. That's going to be um, coming up uh, in just a you know, a little over a month and month and change. It's going to be in Chicago. We're going to be there. Uh, Code Fresh um, is giving the keynote at ArgoCon, which is co-located with KubeCon. Uh, we have a great program there. So if you haven't registered for ArgoCon, you should do so now because the seats are filling up and there's not going to be room. So get that done. Um, GitOpsCon Europe was just announced and uh, the CFP, the, the call for papers is open. It closes in, I think, about two weeks. So uh, do that. It is going to be a virtual conference for GitOpsCon. So even if you don't think you can travel, get your talks in, go register. We would love to have you. Um, and then uh, any other announcements? No, we're going to have some other announcements shortly from CodeFresh. So stay tuned. Make sure you're following us on Twitter or LinkedIn where uh, you can keep up with everything that we're doing. So with that, let's jump into the discussion because uh, Ephraim, your team, um, I mean, first of all, the Israeli stock exchange is, is obviously dealing in a, a highly sensitive in industry, highly regulated industry. So you have some unique challenges. Um, for for people that maybe aren't familiar with the Tel Aviv stock exchange, do you want to just introduce the company? I mean, obviously, you guys are handling stocks, you're doing trading. Um, how, how would you introduce people to kind of the unique challenges that you have? Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, we are Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. We are the only stock exchange in Israel. And we're handling also the clear and also the everything in Israel. So uh, we have a couple of uh, aspects that we're dealing uh, in the business. The, in, in the business, we have uh, the trading systems that is calling uh, matching engines. And we have uh, clearing systems. And uh, we also have the, our website. You can see after it, it's at ACOIL. And, and we also have a system that's called Maya in order to get uh, people uh, uh, info from the companies that are uh, in the stock exchange. So if, if a company that's listed on the stock exchange is changing a CEO or there's something new, so we are sending the messages uh, to all our customers in order to, to get the information they need in order to buy and sell stocks in our stock exchange. So I think the main issue that is pretty unique here that we are fully on-prem. I know that uh, most of the companies that uh, are today are born in the cloud. We are uh, born like uh, 75 years ago. Uh, there's no computers uh, right now. But uh, I think in the last 30, 40 years we are here. Uh, we have our own data centers and we need to handle them. And this is a very unique uh, opportunity to do these things. And this is why I think we're so uh, not so usual 
as other companies that are born uh, these days and working uh, in the cloud, from the cloud, born in the cloud. Uh, so we are different. Yeah, I mean, you're you're basically, I mean, being cloud native in this case, you're using Kubernetes, uh, you know, in containers and things like that. So you are cloud native, but with your own data center, with your own hardware. Uh, do you think, I mean, it, that's probably driven primarily by security and regulation. I mean, maybe you're, are you legally, I mean, they do have like Google Cloud and AWS have data centers in Israel, um, but are you pre precluded from using cloud or is it more, no, we actually feel like for our customers, the trust that we have, it's more important for us to manage our own data centers. First of all, we already have uh, same costs because we have our data centers. Uh, so if, if you're looking on, on ROI or if you're looking on business needs, there's no need for now uh, to being on cloud. Uh, but uh, we have our data centers, we have our server engineers, we have our network engineers, we have, we have our storage engineers. So we're getting very intimate with our hardware. And this is what gave us, uh, giving us an uh, edge on the companies that are born in the cloud, because we know how to tweak and how to use the hardware in order to make it better, in order to, to, be, to make it the best fit to our business needs and to our software. Well, and you probably have better cost controls. I, I know that going on-prem is actually a little bit of fashion right now. You have DHH, uh, for those that don't know him, he's the CEO of Basecamp. He's on Twitter as, as at DHH. Um, he famously said, we're ditching the cloud. We're not going to be in the cloud anymore. We're going to open our own data centers. We're going to move everything on-prem. And uh, he's claiming that they're saving uh, a little over, I think, $1.5 million a year right now. Um, by operating their own data centers. So I am curious to see if that trend catches on. It, you guys started doing that 75 years ago, but maybe uh, maybe you're more forward thinking than you realized um, with uh, with the way things are going. Um, with that said, so you're, you're on-prem. Now, uh, Kubernetes, I mean, um, I, I should have asked you actually a little bit about that but uh, beforehand, but... Um, it was Kubernetes the the weapon of choice here, and I'm sure you have a mixed set of of architectures and things that you're running. Yeah, so uh, we we are only our our first date of our first days in the Kubernetes. Most of our uh, most of our uh, systems are not Kubernetes; are more legacy, yeah. like uh, servers and uh, Linux servers. And we're doing our first uh, first steps into Kubernetes world, and we do, we use it uh, on prem also. Uh, but I think it's it's always it's it's, it's always the ask of uh, what the business needs because you need to to find the, the right tool and you need to find the right platform for the business. So yeah. uh, for, for now, because we're running a legacy software and we have something that is more legacy, so for 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 the business needs right now, I think that servers are more fit. But uh, we're looking forward to the future, and you know, and we know that we're gonna have uh, new uh, new needs. So we're starting to, to think about uh, Kubernetes, also, but it will be on-prem. Mm. Uh, so nowadays we're starting our first uh, application on-prem. In the past, we have a center, center of excellence uh, project that we did in the in the side that was on Kubernetes, and it was it's still it's still in production. But uh, today is going to be the the mass the mass adoption of uh, Kubernetes. So uh, we're doing our first uh, project with the software team in order to bring them up on uh, Kubernetes. And also uh, from now on, I think uh, for new software that is greenfield, uh, we're going to use Kubernetes. Uh, regarding the brownfield and migration, this is uh, another another subject, and uh, not right now. Yeah. Okay. So you're you're evaluating, you know, the shift. And I actually I was talking with somebody yesterday that was telling me about the transition they've been working on from legacy to newer software, and uh, they were telling me that even though they're not writing their apps anymore in Java they're required to make it look like Java. It needs to look exactly the same for the financial uh, services, you know, users that they have. And, and they don't care that it needs to look exactly the same. And all the buttons need to be in the exact same place because really they don't want anything different. And of course they're driven to, well, we actually need to modernize this stuff. We need to be able to maintain it. So their job is essentially to re-implement something exactly as it is already but in something that they can uh, better maintain with with their choices now. So, do you do you face challenges like that with these migrations, or um, are is there a little bit more like 
um, forward thinking, uh, you know, desire from people to kind of shift things into more modern, you know, context? So first of all, I want to, to say about the, the first object. So we had the same project five, six years ago. Uh -huh. uh, we we had mainframe and we have a GUI on the mainframe. I thought it's it's a GUI, but it's a black uh, black screen. Uh -huh. And when we and when we mi migrate to Linux, it's it's still the same GUI. So all the people that working on this, uh, all the the customers are still on the same GUI. It doesn't know that we moved from uh, mainframe to Linux because th this was the business need. So this was uh, the first thing regarding the second question. I think we're looking forward. I think we need to modernize applications. And we need to to bring a new technology and the new features because uh, the past is the what what the uh, what was the needs in the past and I think the future uh, we need to look on the future and use uh, new technologies in order to to be in, in the market. Yeah, I, so so there is like that desire to kind of do it. I mean, it is funny. Like every every five years, it's like, hey guys, we got to modernize. You know, you you start the modernization trend, but. Um, I mean, before we before we go into the next question, I just want to read the comment from Nassim, which I thought was very good. He said, some companies that initially embraced cloud-based solutions are currently shifting towards on-premise infrastructure, primarily driven by cost-related factors. While the cloud was a sound choice initially, as these companies expand, the return on investment no longer justifies maintaining a cloud-based setup. And I think, you know, it's like cloud, it's like, hey, it's really easy and you can very easily spin up new stuff. You can be very productive. So if you're in growth mode, if you're just trying to get people to be productive and you're trying to innovate, cloud's amazing because it's like, hey guys, here's the keys to the car, go nuts, do what you got to do. Uh, but of course, the flip side of that is that the cost controls can be pretty tricky. And and uh, I was just um, playing with some new uh, tooling the other day in a cloud, I'm not going to say which one. And I switched on an API and, it was, and then I read the fine print and it's like, if you use this API, it's a minimum a couple thousand dollars a month. And I'm like, oh, shut that off. Shut that off. Like, I, I just wanted to play around. I just wanted to look. I didn't want to, like, you know, buy the car at this point. Um, but I, I, I am curious, you know, for for you, there's probably a pretty big mix of technologies that you're supporting. What's the spread like from a language standpoint and um, organization standpoint? Like, what are people coding in? Yeah, so I think our case is very unique because we are like coding everything. So we have we have in the front, we have like 10 languages that we're using on the front end. We have like 10, 10, 10 uh, languages also in, in, in the back end. So whatever you can think about it, uh, if it's if it's Java, if it's Node.js, if it's Angular, if it's React, if it's C Sharp, if it's .NET Framework, if it's .NET Core, it's whatever you can think about it, we yeah. use. And uh, this is uh, making a, uh, a problem to the DevOps team, of course, and this is what we'll talk about uh, in a couple of minutes. But uh, this is the this is the situation right now. Uh, like every every developer coming with his uh, own unique language because he is feel comfortable with it, and we let him uh, develop in these uh, languages. And uh, so this is what we have uh, the, this variety in our uh, organization. And for for those like you know, for that mix of stuff, like, do you guys have an onboarding strategy to help people that are new come on and um, get up and running quickly? Because every, you know, organization is a little bit different. Maybe the way you deploy is unique. Um, and especially for people that maybe haven't worked with on-prem before, maybe they're only use cloud. Um, do you kind of have a quick training for them? Do you have some special tools you try to get them into? Yeah, so for you, every employee I think will come, will have two onboards. First of all, they will have to onboard to the developer teams because uh, they have the, the the methodology and uh, they have the language that they're working together. So this was this will be the first onboarding. The second onboarding will be the onboarding to the DevOps, to the CI/CD stuff, and other things that we're doing together. Uh, we we created a uh, CI CI/CD pipelines and tools for everyone. Uh, we're using uh, Jenkins. Uh, we're using Groovy in order to, to automate our CI/CD stuff. And we're in every language. We're using uh, the specific language to uh, compile, so the, C, the the CI is different between the languages. Mm. Uh, but deployment, uh, if it's uh, Windows or Linux, is the same. We're using Ansible and we're writing playbooks in order to deploy. So when they when it comes to DevOps, I think with the standardized, it's more sta it's more standardization in the organization. Uh, but when you're talking about 
developers, every developer got his own team and every team got his own languages. So this is different. Yeah, I, I, this is like something that I've been surprised to see working really well for us. I mean, we, we did a, um, we did a, uh, a keynote at Argo Con a year ago with, um, Peloton and, uh, they've been implementing Argo CD and, um, they found that that was one of the most effective onboarding tools that they had. Uh, I mean, especially if you're using Kubernetes, but just to put put in the hands of people hey here's argo cd you can see every app that's deployed you can see their sync policies you know the deployment process is you put your stuff in this repo and it's going to get deployed that's how it works you know it's git driven and um so what you know when i when we designed codefresh and we focused a lot on uh kind of the enterprise argo cd experience a lot of our focus was really about hey how do we make devops more efficient how do we uh help people do traceability and stuff but I didn't expect that one of the huge benefits would be onboarding is just a lot easier when everything is clear and labeled and, and out there. Um, so I don't know, do you have a, do you have like a target for how long it takes a developer from when you hire them to their first commit getting deployed somewhere? Yeah, it's, I think it's very uh, depend on the team and the, and that the language sense. you're using, but it's somewhere between uh, three months and six months. Uh, regarding the Argo CD, we're also onboarding in the last uh, couple of months in Argo CD. And I think it's a very nice product. And I think it's like, you know, when in every sector you have a couple of software, but when you're talking about deployment and on Kubernetes, there is only one software that everybody using. Mm -hmm. uh, even uh, the last KubeCon that I was in uh, Amsterdam, like everyone is talking about uh, Argo CD and everyone is using Argo CD, whatever developer, whatever DevOps, a colleague that you that that I talk with uh, in in KubeCon, everyone it's 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 taking Cargo CD. It's like uh, the days where everyone uh, got from all the orchestrator to Kubernetes. So this is uh, I think this is the the same uh, the same area right now. Like yeah. everyone is Cargo CD. Yeah. To uh, to tweak a quote from David Fincher, there are many ways. There are infinite ways to deploy to Kubernetes, but at the end of the day, there's only two. One of them is wrong and the other one is Argo CD. That's how I feel about it. Um, well, so with those, all those languages, with the regulatory environment, with the on-prem, you know, what are some of the major challenges that uh, you, you've experienced as an engineering organization? So I think the, 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 the first thing is the, the variety of languages because you have to, to create pipelines and you have to create a CI CD to all the softwares. So this is the, the main problem. Second problem that uh, we're on-prem, so we cannot use API, we cannot uh, use cloud API. So we need to build our own tools. We need to write our own code, our own scripts, our own pipelines, our own everything. And we cannot use something that already baked and already done in the in the cloud. Uh, so this, these two things are very uh, problematic for us. And the third one is the security. Because uh, I think uh, 10 years ago, when you talk about security, you said, okay, I'm going to going to defend the perimeter from the web. The hackers are going to to DDoS me, and this is the way. Mm -hmm. And we saw in the last couple of years, if you know the Solar Wind case and everything, that hackers are trying to hack the build system. Hackers are trying to hack yeah, get in that supply chain pipelines and the supply chain. So we need to defend it. And also we we are on prem, so it's it's the first uh, wall. But also everything we done, everything we done in the in day by day, security is involved. We we are the best friend of the CISO. We are the we and the we and the CISO are working together day by day on everything, and is involved in the CI CD stuff and the build stuff on everything. He's got in own his own security audit on on everything, and it's something that we're trying to to improve every day. Yeah, the security aspect. I mean. Um... Microsoft just had uh, just announced a couple of security issues. The first one was that they had uh, leaked. Uh, basically, what happened is um, someone had done a stack trace, and the system that was supposed to remove secrets from that stack trace was not functioning at that moment. 
that stack trace was sitting on a developer's machine that developer's machine got compromised. I don't know if it was through email phishing or what, but then hackers got access to the stack trace that was on his machine, found the keys, and then gained access to systems. So they were they, they actually had one of their keys leak in a in such a way that was like, you know, it's like, gosh, there's like 10 different things had to go wrong in order for that hacker to be successful, but they ultimately did get keys to the castle. Um, so that was a problem. And then Microsoft just had another one where they, uh, unfortunately, they went to publish an AI model and they accidentally leaked 38 terabytes of sensitive data. Uh, and I don't know how much of that was user data, but, oh, you know, that's a rough, that's a rough two weeks for Microsoft to announce both those things in the same case. Um, and from a supply chain security standpoint, I mean, I think, in Israel, you guys are probably at a, at an even heightened level of security because um, you're you're not just thinking about oh how do we deal with you know hacking groups and stuff like that, but it's hey we got to deal with state actors who are trying to trying to mess with our financial system as a as a country. Um, so that's probably got to figure into your math a little bit as you're designing these systems and thinking about the security of the supply chain. Um, so how do you how do you approach that problem? I mean. You outlined a little bit the challenge, but uh, you know how do you approach that? And I know you can't share everything on that topic, but um, you know from what you can say. First of all, you close every every network to the internet. I think this is the the first thing you you can do. Uh, but if you open, you open it by proxy, and you open by API management, and uh, you have to scan everything because we're working with uh, with nuggets and we're working with uh, with npm packages. So we need to scan everything. We need to scan every every binary that they're getting inside. Also, we we're, we're scanning the code, scanning the code for uh, you know for uh, loops and uh, the holes that they can be a problem in the in yeah. the fuzz action. testing, checking to see if there's overflows that can be done, errors are handled properly. Yeah, and we're also uh, storing the the secrets. Uh, not in our Git, in order that if a hacker is gonna get access to our Git, uh, he will not have the the password for the databases and all the yeah. secrets that we're using, and also the permissions inside. Uh, every developer got permission for what he need. He doesn't see other repositories, he doesn't see other servers, he doesn't see nothing. He, he needs yeah. to see only what he need. Minimal permissions, yeah, best practice for sure. I on the on the storing secrets in Git. You know, we all know, hey, we don't store secrets and get, we don't store secrets and get, we don't store secrets and get. Though we do have Bitnami secret, uh Bitnami secrets, which do allow you to encrypt secrets and put them in a repo. I know that a lot of people have just a visceral reaction to that. They're like, no, 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 you can't put the secret in there. Um, but it is encrypted against the uh, public key of the Kubernetes cluster. There's, I mean, that if that encryption is is broken, the whole internet is broken. It's it's the same encryption that we use to do SSL to websites. And it's the same, you know, technology that we use for all of our secure communications. So do you feel like that's, I'm, I'm not, I'm not asking if you guys are using it, but from a security perspective, do you still feel a discomfort with um, potentially using something like a, a sealed secrets controller? Yeah, uh, we're using other software. I will not reveal the name, but yeah, but we're, we're using other other software and uh, the secrets are there. And uh, in, in the process where we're going to the vault, it's it stories in vaults. And then in the process, we're going to the vaults. And if you have the access to the to get the secret, and then you get the secrets and that's it. So it's a different, it's a different software. It's not on the same, it's not on the same, uh, it's not on, on the same platform, and even in 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 every environment, we got our own system in order not to to be the same secret on uh, in the same environment. So we have uh, even a vault for every environment. Yeah. So we have right. secrets are not uh, together from couple of environments in order to to do it. Yeah, that's perfect. I mean, it's it's such a it's such a challenge, and um, so from a from a software delivery standpoint. You mentioned that you have uh, all of these different languages that you're supporting, these different teams with different needs. 
does your build and delivery process differ greatly between those or have you been able to make that a common software delivery process? So I think I think that it's, it's something around 80% that together and we have the 20% that is a variety. Uh, because if you if if we look at the uh, CI, so uh, every uh, every language that got its own CI, uh, because if you're using Java you're using Maven, if you're using C it's CMake, and uh, if you look at the uh, look at Restore or, or whatever, it's 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 different uh, process. But regarding the deployment, we're trying to do it the same because we're trying mm -hmm. to to package it and to deploy it to the server in the same way. Of course, there is languages that you cannot do it. Like if you're talking about Angular, there are special parameters like minus minus prod that is scrambling the variables and uh, doing a tree shaking. So you can't build once and deploy many. You have to build in every environment because in development, you want that the variables that you know the variables and you can debug it. But in production, you don't want the customer will that, that will know your uh, environment variables and it doesn't want to and it to be it, it should be very light in order to to be fast so uh, regarding a couple of languages we have problems even in the deployment stuff yeah yeah i mean the the the, the more you can get it to be the same so much better and obviously that's a big advantage of containerization and being able to say hey look i'm at the end of the day i'm just shipping a container so like I don't really care if it has .NET in it or C Sharp. Like, I've got a security scanning system that's going to deal with both of these languages. I've got tests that are going to run regardless of the language. And this is like a lot of the philosophy be behind um, shared pipelines or uh, dry pipelines. You know, do not repeat yourself this is the classic mantra. So if I can create a single software delivery pipeline that handles all of these deployments, handles all the builds suddenly my workload the amount of work you know the amount of attention i have to pay to that whole process goes down i'm able to be freed up to really mature out the rest of the stack so it definitely is very nice i mean getting to 80 percent, especially in an organization that you mentioned is like hey we got a lot of legacy you know we just we moved a lot of stuff from mainframes five years ago that's pretty impressive i mean getting to 80 percent is that's no joke that's a that's a serious task yeah uh, it it's took us uh, something around uh, six years to do it, so it's not wow. like a not like a one night success. Uh, when, and we're trying to to make it better because uh, every day we're trying to make to make it more standardized and to see what can be together and trying to to bring the developers together, although they are different teams and also and although they have uh, not the same ideas. But we're trying in you know, in the DevOps side or in the CI CD side, the promotion side and deployment side. Uh, to bring them together and trying to to learn from one each other and to have the same path. Hmm. Now, do you? Um, well, actually, we have a question from the audience. So Neo writes, uh, "How do you approach security scans on your CI/CD pipelines, given complexities you have with different languages and teams? Do you employ employ policy as code or do manual security scans?" Uh, so we have both. We have both. We we have uh, also uh, manual scans that the CISO and the security teams doing. We all we have also policies for every languages. And we have like the the minimum policy, so everyone can uh, use it. And if you're a team leader, and want to add extra policy, you can do it. So we have like the thing that is uh, it's like the minimum for everyone. And this is a uh, one policy for all. And then if you are a team leader or if your team want to add extra stuff, you can do it. Hmm. One of the patterns that I've seen and. I don't know if I'd go so far as to call it a dark pattern, maybe a gray pattern um, for software is they will build their binaries outside of their Docker files and then just load the binary into the Docker file uh, and then ship that. And they do that because they're like, well, you know, then I can just send someone the binary. They don't have to use the Docker image. Uh, but your developers in general, it's like, well, should they be just using the binary? Like they should probably use it because now they're getting environment differences and stuff. So, you know, my my feeling has always been, look, I want to build it in my Docker image uh, and I want to ship it in my Docker image. And then I want to scan my Docker image, including the binaries within it. And that in a lot of ways simplifies my process from a CICD perspective because I'm not thinking like, oh, I need to manage... Golang versions in my pipeline. It's like that's 
that's baked into the image. Like, I don't, I don't need to know. I don't have to actually care that much about like the specific version um, it, unless it's impacting security or stability or, or something like that. So I don't have to like manage that from an environment standpoint, which frees me up some more. Um, is that, well, actually let's go to Steven's question. So he says, what policy engine is being used for the policies? And and that may not be something you're comfortable sharing. I don't know. Uh, we're using a software. I think uh, most of the company are using. Uh, that is coming with its own policies. This was the, the the first draft of the policies. Then we work together with the CISO and the security teams in order to add our own needs. So did, we add it. So this is the second layer of the policy, and the third layer it's it's unique for every team. It's unique for every languages. Mm. Uh, and we, you know, I I see kind of two different places for big security policy implementation. First is in the CI CD pipelines where we're actually doing, you know, builds and scans and we have an effective policy based on, hey, do you meet these different benchmarks in order to ship this container up or ship this binary up? And then you've got like the runtime policies, like Steven is pointing out, like a Kyverno, um, a Kyverno or an open policy agent where it's like, hey, I can, I can deploy this policy engine onto my cluster and I can do stuff like um, attestations. I want to verify that this image was <clears throat> co-signed by CodeFresh. It was built in CodeFresh. I want to have that working with my o OIDC provider so that it's not going to be using the same tokens. I wanted to get a token for each run. I want to have a Kyverno policy that checks on admission. Hey, did everything happen with this properly? And if it didn't, I want to keep my current deployment running and not, you know, ship this new binary. Um, so do you, I, I guess, do you approach the policy differently from a runtime perspective than you do from a CICD perspective? So it depends. When when we create our Kubernetes uh, project, uh, we had, we also signed uh, during the CI stuff. And when we, when we build the container, we sign them. And we allowed on the runtime only to running the signed containers. This was yeah. the first. Thing. The second thing uh, that we learned the connection between the the pods, and then we said, okay, from now on this is the policy. And if if there's something that is not, uh, if it's uh, if pod A calling pod B in a manner that he shouldn't, then I want to uh, to, to to know it, and mm. uh, of course, it's blocked. But uh, I'm also trying to to understand why. Why it happens, but when you're talking about servers, uh, you have uh, you know you have like the legacy stuff in order to uh, you have like the three three tier approach that uh, you know you have the data the data that is on a different uh, v, different land from the from the application itself, and also if you have a web, so this is another uh, uh, server that is not on the same uh, network. And if it's exposed to, to the internet or exposed to customers, so you it doesn't have the, the opportunity to do it. When you're protecting a legacy system, system I think it's it's much easier, much, much easier, sorry. Oh, really? It's much easier on the legacy system? Legacy system, it's, I think, for my opinion, yeah, I'm not like, a, but I'm saying it's, it's easier because there's no moving parts. There's no moving mm -hmm. parts. And you can open from one network to the second network, one port, and that's it. And it's... And you and you're okay. Uh, when you have Kubernetes and you and you have moving parts and you have multiple deployments and everything is changing on, so this is a for for my opinion, I think this is more a complex in order to 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 secure this kind of uh, of systems. Yeah, one of the well, one of the challenges, and I mean, to go to the complexity of the cloud native side that I've seen with uh, Kyverno, for example, is. And I know you didn't say that you didn't say Kyverno, and I don't I, I don't know what you're using for your open policy agent. And I wasn't trying to call it out, but that was the question about it. So um even with an open policy agent or Kyverno, is if your controller fails for some reason, like Kyverno goes down, uh and you have like pod recreation happening suddenly the policies are being enacted, but they can't be fulfilled because of Kyverno's not running. And so suddenly you actually can't get stuff running up again. And so I am I like Kyverno. I've used Kyverno uh, and Open Policy Agent. I've used them both. I've used them both with Argo CD and I've given, given talks with these. But I do get a little bit anxious about the idea of like, oh, you know, if somebody were to figure out a way to get Kyverno to fail 
and then cause some kind of pod disruption, I could actually have downtime and that a denial of service attack. Now, to pull that off, what, what do you got to do? You got to figure out how to crash Kyverno. That's problem one, and that's that's no easy task to do. But then problem number two is you have to figure out how to cause some sort of pod disruption to occur. So it's not like it's an easily exploitable thing, but for some reason, I still have that psychological unease of, well, what if I really want to deploy it, you know, and I, and Kyverno doesn't want to let me, but I know better. What's my, you know, what's my game plan for that scenario? Do I have to break glass and disable GitOps and delete stuff manually? How would I approach that? So I don't know, maybe it's, that's a little bit of a can of worms, but I, I imagine that, and I guess, I guess the question is, how do you guys approach, you know, disaster planning? Do you guys war game these things and then try to document, you know, hey, in these scenarios, this is break glass, you know, scenario B, this is the way that we approach it. Um, how do you think about that? So first of all, we're trying that our security will not be mission critical and not be a single point of failure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're trying to to do it like uh, in the side and not uh, inline the system, and that like, the system is uh, and part of the system is its security. We're trying to to find uh, other things to do. Uh, actually, we we had a couple of uh, things and a couple of software that uh, need to be always online. And if if the software is down, so you cannot deploy. And even if even the software is down, if if like you're using software that you want to change. Uh, passwords every 15 minutes and the uh, and the software is down you cannot change the password and then you can even get a system down yeah uh, so i think that the best way and i think that the, the naive way that we choose it's not to go this way <laughs> and trying to, to to avoid it because i think it's a it's, it's a real problem it's a real problem and i don't have a good uh, question and uh, sorry i don't have a good answer how to to do it because it's 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 becoming part of the system becoming part of the system and, can, and the system can be down because of the security uh, so i think it's a trade-off because you want to secure your system but you don't want that to see the security will shut down the system itself so you need to find the, the trade-off yeah. uh, in order to, to to do it i had someone ask me a while ago about like hey you're pushing GitOps, but like what if git goes down and i was like then you then you can't update and they were like, well, that's not acceptable. I need to be able to update. I was like, okay, well, right now your your proposal is I'm going to push stuff directly against the Kubernetes API, either from my machine or from a CI CD pipeline. Um, and I think, okay, well, if Git goes down and you still need to push, you can still do that, but it should be an out of process change, right? So like you didn't lose anything by adopting GitOps um, because you're not blocked from deploying the old way, if you had to, um, it's just a scenario that you should be, you know, it's like, okay, well, I have a scenario where what if Git goes down? Do I have a way to deploy? Yes, I've got to break glass. I've got to retrieve some keys or something. And there's a process for that. I need two people involved or whatever it is. Um, so it's it's like, okay, well, that's a disaster scenario, but we have a plan for it. Um, Arcel has a good question on this. How do you face database changes do you handle it with CI CD? That's a really good question. I'm still uh, looking for a uh, CI CD management for a schema and database. So if someone from the client from the crowd can help us afterward, it will be great. But uh, what we did, uh, we develop a uh, software internally uh, that handle, uh, handle the situation of the database. And uh, we're using, we, we using this software. And this is what making us uh, using the CI CD uh, with database and this is how we can change so like every database got its own version and when you're moving from version 1.1 to 1.2 you're also moving the database uh, to from 1.1 for 1.2 if it's a schema if it's a schema change it's schema change if it's a data change it's a data change but uh, we built something that is fit for us and uh, it's working very well because it's like uh, budget tested uh, it's working yeah. for something like seven eight years it's working across our all systems. Everyone use it, and uh, it's very it's, it's very fit for us. It's not like we have a solution for everyone, but for our needs, it's a, it's it's a good solution. And then you can plug and play to our CI/CD pipeline and enjoy it. Well, I, I mean, I'll, 
I would, it's too bad. It's so well fit for you guys. Cause uh, it sounds like it could be a good open source project, but I will give a shout out to a couple of tools and um, uh, Costas. I just threw it in the chat. Costas just published this blog post um, a week or so ago about using GitOps for database changes. And in this case, he's using a tool called Atlas, um, which gives a declarative format for uh, database schema changes. And this just basically plugs right into Argo CD and CodeFresh so you can manage your database upgrades using um, you know, all the GitOps tools that you normally would. Uh, he's also in the past done, um, he's got another article on this same topic that was about database migrations from a more CICD perspective uh, rather than using GitOps driven changes. And then um, in the past, he's also called out uh, Schema Hero. I don't know if that tool is still super active, but um, I assume it is. I don't know. I don't have any reason to believe it's not. I just haven't looked at it in a while. But Schema Hero is another one where you can set up like a, a declarative format for uh, database schema changes and have it be done in a declarative GitOps friendly fashion. But that's like, it is funny because, uh, you know, we always want services to be stateless. It's like, man, it's so great when they're stateless. They're so easy to run. And uh, I was talking with some um, Google developer experts yesterday. I was in uh, in Mountain View and they were saying like, yeah, man, like I just can't seem to find a way to run an enterprise application that doesn't have state anywhere. It's like one of them always has state and I'm always dealing with like, you know, my node scaling and my pod disruption budgets and like getting that to work so that uh, we, we can run things properly because yeah, and he's like, he's like, I know the answer is like, don't be stateful. And it's like, yeah, don't be stateful. Also, we have to manage state somehow. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a little bit uh, in co uh, in contradiction, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, it is, uh, it is, it is, it is a real challenge to bring the database in. So um, let's see. I think uh, we've got a couple more questions, and, and we do have a little bit more time. So if people have some other questions, bring them up. Um, but uh, I was gonna bring up. Um, let's see. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So have you built, I mean, for the database, you've built some custom tooling to help people manage upgrades. Have you built any components or user interfaces in house to help bridge some of the gaps that your team has had? So uh, we're using uh, Jenkins, but uh, it's got a very good GUI. And we, we we use it uh, we like did it our way in order to to make it our uh, changes, and uh, for us I think it's 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 good also the developers like it. We have all the. But you haven't like thrown it in like a backstage or a, a um. What's Not yet. The, their competitor, yeah. Not yet. Okay. Not yet, but we're thinking about it, and it's in it's our uh, you know it's our plans for for next year. But uh, we didn't uh, start with IDP yet. Something There's like another that. great tool called Port. Uh, we did a webinar with them a little while ago. I'll post a link um, for people that, that would want to check it out. It's actually a pretty interesting talk from uh, Costas. But um, yeah, these, these developer platforms are definitely all the rage. Everybody wants to have a developer platform. And they seem to be all trying to kind of reinvent the wheel a little bit. Uh, I'm not, it's not that I'm opposed to it. It's that... Um, you know, when it comes to like helping people deploy more frequently, get more out of stuff, I feel like a platform like CodeFresh, and obviously I'm biased, but it's like, hey, that's going to expose your life cycle. It's going to bring in your Jira tickets. It's going to it's going to link up the CI processes. Um, that's probably going to be more bang for your buck than figuring out how to get links to builds onto a wiki. You know what I mean? Because it's like people can navigate to builds. It's more about getting this larger set of information, correlating it, having a process for making changes, doing reverting changes if we need to, and, and bringing in the cheer tickets and those kinds of things. I feel like that's way more effective than um, than just getting stuff into a wiki. But let's let's turn to the future then for a second. So where do you think DevOps is headed in the next three years? I think like everyone is talking about platform. Uh, so I will take part of the platform. I think that the self-service 
because I think as this DevOps, you don't want to be a bottleneck. So you yeah. have to you have to give self service to the developers. It doesn't matter which software or which manner. If it's an IDP, if it's I don't know a script that they can use, but I think they have the they have to be to have the ability to work by their own and to be to be the owners of the of the pipelines and to be the owner of everything. Yeah. No, their DevOps team will not be the bottleneck because, like in Taste, my team. Also, it's a the great team and the best team in, in the world. We we are six engineers and we have like one hundred developers. So mm-hmm. it doesn't scale. It doesn't scale, and you have to give them the ability to self serve and to do whatever they need by themselves. Of course, we are you, you are still here, and of course we will help them, and of course we will develop the tools. But I think self service is the way. Even in in our organization, I think this is the next steps. Yeah, the the self service aspect. I feel like we're gonna be able enable, be able to enable that, and I'm gonna say a bit of a buzzword. I, I just apologize to everybody in advance, but we're probably gonna be able to do a lot with AI. I mean, I feel like that's and it's it's kind of one of those things where um, AI is like very buzzy, and so half the time people are like, "We're gonna do that with AI." It's like bullshit. You're not doing anything with AI. You know, it's like <laughs> you you know you just slapped an AI label onto it and you. Uh, you have an LLM prompt that says, how was your day? And and you've you've called it a solution. You're not there. Um, you know, that's fine. Every new technology at the very beginning feels a little bit like a scam because it kind of is because it's not real yet. But from a real perspective, it's like, well, dang, you know, like I got all this data about like deployments that work, deployments that fail. I can like figure out the risk you know, factor for, for changes and, and expose that that's pretty helpful. Or, um, even a project like, uh, Kate's GPT, that's just, Hey, here's what's wrong with your cluster, breaking it down in simple English and giving people instructions, linking to the documentation they need to look at. That's just saving time. Um, so I mean the self-service aspect, it's like, um, I've seen people doing conversational deployments where they'll, they, there's some tools where you can basically say, Hey, can you give me a, a three node cluster on AWS? And it's like, okay, working on it, we'll set it up. And then it's spitting back your endpoint. Um, that's nice. Um, I don't know if that's like the, the game changer though, because it feels like it's more about like, that makes me more poor productive, but how much more productive am I than clicking a button, you know, that because I typed in and said some stuff. Um, is it just as quick to basically click a button? Does every interface have to be an AI? I don't know. But uh, the other flip side of it from a Dallas perspective, and I'm sure this is something you guys are going to be facing or, or facing already, is how from a Dallas perspective do I support all of the machine learning and AI that my teams are going to want to deploy? Because that's a unique challenge where, dang, like I got to manage GPUs now. I got to be thinking about um, VRAM all of a sudden in a way that I haven't had to think about that before. Where do I store these models? Do I have a good um, storage system for my Kubernetes cluster, for my services where I can do that? Should I be thinking about micro VMs? So I, I, I feel like it's less about how is DevOps going to change? It's more like how is DevOps not going to get run over by the AI demand that their users are throwing at them? So I don't know if that's a challenge you're already facing, but it's definitely something that that is in code fresh. I mean, we're we're dealing with that uh, for sure internally. No, I think it's I think it's uh, we are in the early days of of, of this kind of change. Uh, gladly, it, uh, it it's not on my door yet, but yeah. I think it will be in the next couple of years because everyone is talking about it. But I I, I don't think that uh, you know you're gonna see in the couple of months uh, AI in every dev, every DevOps tools because I think mm-hmm. that there is a much bigger problems that uh, AI can solve. And I don't, I don't think that the, the native is, okay, let's let's do things with deployments and CI CD stuff. I think there is uh, better things to do with AI, but uh, let's see. We did look at one point we were like, you know, do we need to train a model to like build code fresh CI CD pipelines and stuff? And I think, uh, w- you know, we went to like chat GPT and told it to build one and it knew the spec and it built it. And we were like, I guess we don't need to like actually build anything to do that because it already does it. So like, I just tell people like, if you need help, oh, you got some cool. chat GPT, throw it in there. It'll generate itself for you and it works. So, so why not? Um, 
Yeah, it is. It is an interesting challenge. And from a future proofing perspective, you guys are already on prem. So uh, the cool kids, you know, they want to bring that back and you were already cool. It's like staying, you know, it's like wearing like, oh, I only wear clothes from the 80s. And then like it came back in style and you're like, all right, like <laughs> I'm back hip again. You know, I don't know about you, but like I'm a dad. So it's like that happens sometimes where it's like, oh, my my high school style is getting cool again. Awesome. I'm cool dad again. I was way out of fashion for a while, but now I'm back and uh, feeling fashionable. That's nice. Yeah. Well, um, so uh, as we kind of wrap up here, and again, I want to thank the audience and appreciate everybody with your comments and and being engaged and, and sharing this stuff. And um, Ephraim, you've already s- shared a lot of uh, very interesting insights from your organization um, any questions from the audience that you guys want to get in? I mean, we've been kind of doing it as we went along. Um, but uh, maybe maybe I'll ask you one that's a little more challenging. How do your developers feel about the current implementation? Are they happy or do they feel hamstrung? Do they feel like they're able to get their stuff done really quickly? So I think if you look at the developer from their perspective, uh, every developer got his own language. He's working with his own language. He knows the language. and uh, so for, from their perspective, everything is okay, but you know, it's 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 not the, the optimum because if you look like the organizational perspective, it's it's need to be changed because you, you cannot work with the 20 languages in one organization with the 100 uh, developers. Mm-hmm. You have to get some standardization because if you want to move developers from one team to another, if you want to share ideas between teams, you cannot work that every team got its own language. So for them, it's okay. They, they're doing what they want and they're using uh, the best uh, the best tool that they want and they have the knowledge in the tool because so they don't need to to learn nothing and everything is is easy for them uh, but if you look at the organizational there's uh, things that need to be changed in order to to us to be more scalable in order to us to be ready for the future so if they if they're mostly happy what are your three things that you don't like about your DevOps right now? What are three things that you feel like, I really wish we did these things better. And these are the things I want to go tackle. Yeah. So first of all, is the variety <laughs> of the developers. Uh, something that we're trying to, to do uh, without uh, success for now, but uh, something that we're going to hit more in the next future. Mm. Second, I think we have kind of a technology death because, uh, you know, we're still, as you said, we're still using Jenkins. I'm not saying it's better or something, but uh, you know we used Jenkins for the last uh, six years, and we we're trying to to find other things, and we're using uh, we we're using stuff that is pretty old, five six years or all the technology in our CI CD stuff. Uh, so it's something that we along the way we have death uh, death that we death that we need to to improve. Yeah. And the third thing is that we need to improve our self service, as I said, because now it's not self service. We're not the bottleneck, but we can be a bottleneck if we continue this way. So we need to change it. We need to to be more. We need to empower the developers. Uh, and and we have and we have it's it's a journey with the developers, because uh, some of them are are, are more uh, empowered. Or some of them uh, more want to 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 be owner of the stuff. Yeah. Uh, but in the middle of the way, we need that everyone will be on board. We need that everyone will be owner for the developer stuff. And it's something that we need to improve. Well, some that it reminds me, someone was telling me yesterday, because you were talking about the technical death problem of like, hey, I've got these tools that are aging. They're, you know, they're not necessarily designed for the new stuff. Um, I was talking to somebody who does a lot of consulting and uh, they were telling me like, man, just we're trying to work with this customer who they embraced cloud native, but they're using Jenkins to deploy everything. They're doing it all like they're using the new technologies, but they're using them all in the old way and they're realizing it's a problem. And I was just like, oh, that is my bread and butter for Code Fresh, man. Like anytime we we talk to people who are like, we're embracing new tech, we're embracing the new technologies with the old techniques and we're we're struggling. It's like, that's my, that's my person, you know, that like they're so happy, you know, when you can start like deploying Argo CD and you can start doing GitOps and you can start, seeing that stuff it's just like oh i'm using the new stuff the old way now i can use the new stuff the new way that feels really good so all right 
final question as we as we close out here um would you do things differently at a company that wasn't so security focused that where that wasn't such the critical focus do you think you'd take a different approach than what you're doing uh with the Tel Aviv stock exchange yes i think that the security respect that we're using in every project that we're using everything that we do along the way uh, we need to be more secure okay uh, because uh, what we talked in the in the couple of the, the the last hour about the security and about the vectors attacks that is new uh, we, we need to be more secure and we need to think mm -hmm. about it on day one on every project on every tool on every new technology that that, that is coming we're, first we're talking about security then we're talking we're talking about other things including that we are not doing a couple of things because of the security. Because if, if there is a security a problem or security breach that, that can be, so the project is going to be canceled because security is the first thing that we use. The first thing in our mind is security. Yeah. Yeah. Afterwards, it's, it's, it's all the other things. Uh, regarding what you said before, uh, we decided on the new, uh, on the new technology, uh, working with the new CI CD stuff. Hopefully it, uh, it will be good. Uh, as, as I said, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to work with Agro CD and it's great. And for the CI stuff, uh, we're trying to work with Tekton. Until now, it's it's great. So we are not carrying on the technical death and Jenkins and all the old stuff that we're doing to the new technology. We're trying to, to make it from Greenfield. Hopefully that will be the, the right choice, but this is what I can tell you in, you know, in the next year or about two years from now. Well, you know, even even if you weren't working in a secure industry, uh, I just read this story about Paw Patrol. I don't know if do you, do you have Paw Patrol in Israel. Is that a course, thing? This is, this it's is ev it's everywhere, right? Okay. So Paw Children Patrol every day, all day watching Paw Patrol. It's like right. Uh, Kids are watching <laughs> Paw Patrol. They're loving it. This is not mission critical, you know, kind of infrastructure approach and. Uh, apparently they shipped, they had a licensing deal where they shipped out these snacks. And so all these kids are buying snacks and on the snacks, they have a promotion that's, Hey, go to the website and register that you bought our snacks and you win a prize or something like that. Well, they let the domain expire before the sh snacks shipped. And so a domain squatter moved in and who are domain squatters? Well, they're people that put, put up websites that are designed to, capture the attention of people who didn't expect to be there and they don't really care who's looking and so it's typically very bad you know not great stuff and uh so it turns out they had to do a recall cost them millions of dollars on all these paw patrol snacks because they didn't have a good it you know uh security chain to think hey we got to renew that domain um and i don't know if, if if i think it was the domain expired and they weren't hacked but maybe it was hacked or something i can't remember what exactly what happened but basically like you know paw patrol doesn't seem mission critical until you're sending kids to a bad website then it feels like kind of mission critical so i don't know it's it's uh it is interesting but um i really appreciate your insights and thank you so much for that uh thank you everybody for the comments steven arcel uh on a rio to, Thank you so much for joining us and, and everybody else. Um, so coming up for Merging to Maine, I did tell you, I teased that there's going to be a new host. Uh, we're going to be announcing that soon, and we'll have a new lineup uh, coming out. Right now, we're very focused on ArgoCon, KubeCon coming up. I mentioned GitOpsCon, CFP is open, so make sure to submit for that. Link is in the chat, um, up at the top of the chat. Uh, but we will be announcing some new shows shortly. We have some guests lined up that are spectacular. Um, and, uh, so stay tuned for that. And of course, as always, if you have not yet gotten GitOps certified, CodeFresh offers the world's fastest growing, most popular GitOps certification, go to learning.codefresh.io and you can get GitOps certified. We have an amazing program to do two levels of Argo certification, a Argo certification level one includes things like Canary releases using Argo rollouts, how to structure your repositories. Uh, level two includes how to do this stuff at scale. So you're getting into application sets. You're getting into these more complex scenarios. So if you haven't done it yet, make sure to go do that and share that with everybody. And of course, become a GitOps champion. When you do the certification, you get linked to 
the uh, our Discord community, which is the GitOps Champions, where you can meet with like-minded individuals who are focused on implementing GitOps, get your questions answered, share knowledge. So it's a really great community that we have with the GitOps Champions. So with that, Ephraim, any final words, anything you want to plug coming up? I just want to thank, uh, to thank uh, Codefresh and you, Dan, for hosting me and for inviting me. And also for all the audience that uh, keep with us uh, till our uh, end. So uh, thank you everyone for, for watching this episode. Absolutely. It's so interesting to learn about the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, how you guys approach software delivery. You guys have a problem set that is unique for most of our audience. I mean, you're dealing with state actors. You're dealing with, uh, you know, uh, these people that are really coming after you guys. So it's really impressive how you guys deliver software, keep it secure, and have a really impressive service record. So well done. Congratulations on that. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much, Dan. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you at the next one. Uh, enjoy your Thursday, headed into the weekend. And as always, stay tuned. We'll always have more news coming out from Code Fresh. Signing off. Bye. Thank you.